So welcome everybody to the SCURF Thursday community call. Today is August 4th, 2022, and we are going to be discussing the topic of HR and kind of working in Web3 as kind of like a general idea um, that might not necessarily seem like the most super exciting topic, uh, but I do think that there's quite a bit of value here. Um, I'm looking forward to having a discussion today, so um, perhaps uh, people who are more accustomed in these sessions to being able to just kind of sit back, relax, and listen. I think that you'll still be able to have that experience, but I have a very high tolerance uh, for kind of thoughtful silence. So uh, as we kind of work through some questions uh, throughout the day, um, I'm kind of hoping that we will have a variety of voices who are going to chime in with some of their experiences of kind of working in Web3, the challenges of working in Web3, um, challenges organizations have, and things like that. Um, but basically to kind of get it kicked off, uh, I think that this is actually a really great topic to connect to uh, what had happened in previous community calls last week when it came to tooling, because some of the tooling that FOTUS had uh, presented to us throughout the presentation, like some of those are like ultimately about um, kind of HR stuff or kind of coordinating people's behavior and things along those lines. And um, that's, you know, kind of central to some extent to kind of what HR is all about. And so I think that this was a really good framework or this was a good kind of transition into this talk about like HR and working in Web3 because ultimately it's about aligning people's behavior and how do we get tasks completed um, with one another. I'm coming into this conversation with a little bit of a bias because I also have like my own experiences in the HR world, but that was kind of in Kind of a union leadership position and so like some of my thoughts about what i see in web3 and DAOs and stuff like that uh, are also very colored by that so i'm looking for a variety of perspectives into some of these things um but i think that this raises like so the rise of DAOs or the rise of uh, even here at scurf the idea of a community driven organization right that raises i think some really interesting potential questions of like what does it mean for people and like how do people relate to their working or their professional or like maybe even just like their how do they earn lives and so those are the types of questions that i think might be very uh, meaningfully at the heart of the adoption of web3 work uh, and uh, you know how do people kind of get their foot in the store, how does this world kind of make some sense is, you know, what types of questions uh, might we be able to help people get some um, answers for, some more clarity to, or at least be able to here at SCURF host the types of conversations about how do we find these types of solutions? Because I think that that's very important to that is what we are ultimately about is kind of how do we help people find um, some of those solutions. So while I anticipate that today we'll have a little bit like there will be more kind of some governance and DAO types of ideas that we're talking about. Um, I did also want to kind of come into this conversation and prime it with the idea that many of the designs and mechanisms that we see in the non-DAO part of the SCURF forum, where we have things like uh, privacy and incentive mechanisms and things like that, uh, are also kind of incentivizing this kind of world of kind of working in Web3 and how does one kind of have greater agency and be able to kind of manifest their best working lives by potentially working with multiple companies or by working with gigs or being part of communities that have lots of incentive mechanisms or doing things like bounties. And so all of those designs are kind of allowing people to do these types of things as well. We have kind of this rise of DAOs and kind of this interesting idea ideas or interesting ideas around like what is the meaning of hierarchy and all that type of stuff so i'm hoping that like all of this milieu of thoughts will lead to a very good discussion today um, but i don't want to just like kick it off with like so what do we think about the stuff and the things that's not always a particularly helpful uh starting spot um, in my mind there are a few areas of particular interest where some of these or that I consider kind of key question areas. Um, the first would be, it, what is a responsibility uh, that DAO or DAO-like organizations have to the people that uh, are doing work for them? So again, this is my, my union leadership uh, showing. I, 
people? What is an organization's responsibility to the people who do things for that organization? Um, so that might be an initial starting question. Um, I'm also very interested in things like what does it mean to be management or what is management or what is a hierarchy uh, in these types of spaces and arrangements? Um, I think the potentially another very interesting question is what does it mean to be a member of a community as opposed to an employee of an organization um, and is that a meaningful distinction or is that not too terribly meaningful of a distinction um, and then lastly i think that you know, there's some really big DAOs. like what does it mean or DAO type questions of, of what does it mean to be, like, be hr in these types of organizations uh, hr uh, as much as people may dislike them um, very often hr has done really good work like it exists for a reason, it exists out of some necessity. So, like facilitating um, conflict, or you know, knowing the needs of employees particularly well, or, or whether or not they do that effectively, who knows? But I kind of see these as kind of the key question areas. Um, with that kind of prime, what I'd really like to do now is kind of open it up. Of are there kind of generally active questions about working in web3 or relating to these types of organizations that i may have totally missed like i have my blind spots because i think it would be valuable if we could minimally even surface what are the key questions in this space so uh, hopefully we can start there yeah john go ahead yeah uh this is uh pretty funny because i think you can go on youtube and find a talk i gave four years ago on something called uh, i called the community corporation and i bet you uh, you'd find a lot of crossovers. Uh, but the way I approach this stuff comes from uh, blockchains as the root and not so much DAOs or communities or organizations like that because I like to view blockchains as nations themselves because they are a sovereign currency with programmable money. So when you have that system, you don't have hierarchy or anything like that. You basically have um, the United States and the way we contribute to that organization if you want to call it that or that blockchain that network that ledger is just by producing within the rules of that protocol of that network so when you have different blockchains that you're a stakeholder in you are contributing not so much because you're getting paid but because you like the value set and you like the principles but behind that network or that nation so with all these different blockchains i get to choose which value set i want my economic output to be backed by. So I can choose a value set of science versus a value set of like imperialism. Uh, or I could choose the value set of imperialism because I like the idea of force over over anything. So I get to um, just basically choose the governance I, I belong to. That's the way I like to view it. And then on top of that, you can go through DAOs and organizations that exist within that basic infrastructure of like Ethereum or Bitcoin, those basic principles. I do that. That's some interesting framing of starting at the blockchain. Also, if you get, well, I don't know if I want to find it. It's probably very embarrassing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That's fair too. Uh, Brian, go ahead. I'm muted. There we go. Just a tangential topic, I guess, is one of perception, really public perception, and really the people who haven't adopted into Web3 space. I think there's a lot of friction when you take the conversation and specifically bring up the topic of NFTs, for example. There's a lot of negative sentiment and pushback in just the average person out there. And I feel like it's a challenge that everybody faces. It's not a, it's not a, a <laughs> an applicable comparison to say that, you know, if we talk about Web3 to somebody who doesn't know any better, how can they differentiate joining a DAO versus buying an NFT? And in my opinion, I think a lot of people don't even know that difference. And so um, I guess kind of what I'm getting at here is how do we bridge people into DAOs that aren't already like Web3 uh, people who are like excited about it, right? I, I think there's a real big battle ahead of us uh, in terms of marketing, perception, adoption, and sentiment and uh, I don't really hear many people talk about that very much and and I see it a lot like especially in the video game circles you know there's a huge uh, negative sentiment and I think like there's it's a it's a challenge to look at because to tackle that is I think would be very rewarding for everybody involved to try to push 
crypt, uh, Web3 forward to say that there's a lot more going on in the Web3 space than just buying and selling JPEGs or whatever? Um, and how do we break that uh, image? Anyway, thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, and I also do not want to forget that people are kind of leaving some questions here or some thoughts in the comments as well. Uh, so, Rich, did you want to elaborate on your spicy take of one step forward, two steps back? Sure. Um, I come from a, a long background in the startup world. Uh, I did that for, well, actually, I'm not going to tell you because then it'll date myself. Um, I sure will. Uh, 20 years almost in startups. Uh, then I, uh, for many reasons, um, the grind, the false promises, the long hours, the, all the reasons that uh, became disenfranchised with that space, I got into the co-op space. Um, so what uh, what does collective ownership and collective uh, agency look like? What does revenue sharing look like? And so I kicked off this thing called Stop T United with some friends, uh, with photographers to get together to actually have a true co-op um, and uh, control their own IP and get dividends uh, directly out of the organization that they're working for and vote in AGMs and all the rest of it. Um, that was a radically different uh, ecosystem or, or type of work than the, the traditional business space. Uh, then I got into crypto uh, primarily because I saw that there was tooling available um, with blockchains that allowed people to have even closer direct um, uh, reciprocal value creation with an organization. So you literally, with the correct smart contracts and the correct governance system, you can do work. Uh, and with a revenue generating organization, which unfortunately we are not, but with a rev gen type situation or with some good tokenomics, the work you put into an organization um, can directly reflect the value you get back out of it, the capacity for um, Governance and uh, collective ownership is far higher, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the thing is that though, uh, so DAOs became a, a pretty big thing. I was with Maker for three or four years and we helped kick some of that stuff off. The promise of DAOs uh, hasn't quite caught up with the reality of co-ops 20 years ago, which is sort of disheartening uh, for me sometimes. But um, the with this, this notion of, of what DAOs are, we can see that lots of people, well, everybody sort of has a different idea of what that means, but the general commonality here is it's a, it's, uh, a difference than the thing that came before. So what is a DAO? Well, I don't know, but I can tell you what it's not. It's not a corporate office job, right? And then people are free to fill in the blanks there, but the general principles are that people can govern collectively if they uh, so choose, they can have agency in their own uh, work, environment and ideally that they derive greater benefits out of that contribution than they would if they're just pulling a salary. These things are all very noble um, goals, but I have yet to see uh, maybe any DAOs in our space that actually satisfy any of those things. Uh, there's some challenges. Uh, you need to have a highly organized structure. You need to have a product that you're actually selling and revenue coming in the door. You need to have um, a lot of the frameworks that already exist in co-ops or um, hierarchical businesses to pull these things off. Um, we're start, the crypto space kind of starts from base principles. So as a collective, we're all kind of figuring these things out again, making tremendous progress. So it's probably not going to take, you know, like the Italians, I think, came up with co-ops in the 1600s. So it's not going to take us another 500 years to figure this thing out or 400 years. Um, probably four at crypto speeds, but still it's a bit disappointing that um, this notion of like collective governance, but then you still have um, secret backroom deals and, and all kinds of stuff going on. There's still collusion. There's uh, very limited uh, clarity around revenue share, the tokenomics and um, launches aren't totally fair. Um, the oh yeah and so it, the spicy take yeah anyway so that was a lot of framing so i want it's gonna sound like i'm super down on DAOs. i'm not i spent the last five years trying to build them and i'm still trying to build them so um i think they have tremendous promise but um there's also tremendous risks and a lot of the organizations that i've been involved with and i've seen uh, 
are frankly just like digital door dashes. So it's um, let's get a ton of gig workers together. Let's try to get them aligned on a thing, and let's try to maintain enough uh, capacity to handle the tremendous amount of churn. So I see a, a lot of workers losing healthcare, losing unemployment, losing time off, holidays, all of these things that. Um, the good part of the bad stuff that we're trying to move away from is not getting carried forward as we give up all the bad stuff. And so there's that's what I mean about one step forward, two steps back. So, uh, I'm hoping that this space as a whole begins to think about things like um, work-life balance. Um, and like I said, like what do you do if you have to get dental? Like, what DAO is going to pay your dental? I haven't seen one yet. So um, there's there's things to be considered there when we move into this brave new world. So those. We're about 26 spicy takes all baked into one, but you asked for it, so there you go. I did ask for it, and that was a delightful spicy take, um, which there's a lot in there to unpack and kind of aligning with some of the questions that we're going to get into well, today. Um, I do want to I, rec oh, go I ahead. Yeah. shut myself up. Um, the, we can make this into a useful thing, too, because I think that it aligns with some of the things that I've been thinking about with Scurf and potentially some of the things we can think about here from an HR perspective is how do we fill in some of these blanks and how do we be more equitable and how do we be more supportive of uh, of people and still maintain these notions of uh, agency and collective action and all the rest of it. I, I've done Absolutely. You read my mind. That is... That is where I wanted, hopefully, this conversation to go, is moving from what are the questions and what do we know about them to where are the solutions. So um, I'm glad we are on the same page. Uh, I know we got a bunch of hands up here. Uh, John, you did mention that you want to do like a direct response to Brian's comment. Um, so we'll go with John first, and then it will be Chris, Umar, and Fotis. So go ahead. Yeah, I think it was. Um... What was the comment? The reputation of the space. Um, it, I think it does. There's a lot to be said for improving the reputation of the space, but I've seen a lot of uh, cycles at this point. And every time, like Ethereum, when it came out, no one trusted it, right? It had a horrible reputation at the beginning. And then all of a sudden, it did something. And then tons of people came in to build on it. And then, you know, the cycle before that, someone, Dogecoin weird funny coin and then it did something and people came in to build on it and it's not so much about actively trying to change people's perceptions of the space but it's about building tools that make them their lives better and DAOs, for all their flaws and i uh, largely agree with rich they um for the most part suck at this point but have a lot of potential uh they exist sort of to give more people the opportunity to build something and show what this technology can do. And by doing that, I think the opportunity exists to get people, more people into the technology. Like I, I don't think this technology uh, is going to die out because it does have some bad reputation to it. I just think people will eventually use it whether they know they're using it or not because it is a critical technology for an infrastructure for so many different systems. And stuff like Scurf and all these DAOs can build really cool use cases that will bring the critical people in who will build this new infrastructure. Yeah, just, I'd just like to make yeah, one you. quick reply. Um, and then I also uh, tend to agree with the, the tech stuff. Yeah, go for it, Brian. Just really fast. Yeah, like good design is something you never notice. So I really agree with you there. And I think that's a big challenge that the Web3 space has is to be able to create a product that people can use and they don't even know that they're actually leveraging blockchain. Like once we get to there, maybe things will get better. Anyway, thanks for your thoughts. Yes. Yeah, Chris, go ahead. Yeah, so I actually had a response to all that stuff in the sense of like, one of the biggest problems about the blockchain space in general and specifically DAOs is a lot of the infrastructure is meant for back end, and it's being presented to the public as if they can interact on the front end and as if they should and that is a lot it's it's incongruous for a few reasons but one of the biggest incongruities is that the assumption of people wanting to be their own boss and wanting to get rid of hierarchies and wanting to work from home well we had a whole pandemic 
and we shifted to work from home and we found out a lot of people don't actually want that responsibility. They don't actually want that distance and they don't actually want to be their own boss. They want the hierarchy. So it's not that everyone wants that, but a lot of the assumptions that developers have been working from don't apply to a ton of real people. So then there's this incongruity of what is being pushed towards lay people as if, yeah, you can just go in and, and be your own DAO and become your own boss. And a lot of people are like, actually, I don't want to do that. I just want to show up at work on Monday, clock in at nine, and then go home at five. And then I don't want to be a hierarchy-less DAO where I'm, I'm doing everything and the responsibilities are spread horizontally. And that structure is something that a lot of developers, I think, can work within, but realistic lay people can't work within those, uh, like, it doesn't work in the real world yet. Yes, exactly. Um, and a lot of times, being able to just go into a job and then go back to your normal life is what a lot of people actually want. So this idea of, like, taking on more responsibility within the organization or taking on more responsibility for your own finances if a lot of if a significant number of people don't have one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, it's actually better for them to let the bank take care of it because their accounts are insured. So becoming their own bank, they take on way more risk than is necessary. So the idea that they should be the bearers of their NFTs or the bearers of their wallets when they can go safety deposit box or they can go put this money into a FDIC insured bank account, it's not practical. For people who are living in a place where they have all these protections to then tell them, go do your own thing and be your own protection, especially in a landscape where they're at risk of having rug pulls or having uh, the wrong wallet signature give access to some nefarious group that is going to come and wipe their wallet. Um, so I think the issue becomes, yeah, bridge hacks. Bridge hacks are basically like you don't go to the highest point of security, you go to the least point of security. So it's always going to be like wallet signatures or, or side chain hacks where these things occur, but regular people don't have enough time to get aware of all of those attack vectors to then become their own security. So that's why they just go to a bank account and have the bank do it. And I think the, if the bank was using this technology, obviously it's one thing, but even further, because so many people are vulnerable and then they're being attacked, it doesn't look like good infrastructure to the banks because too many people are unaware of how to use the tools, leaving themselves vulnerable, and then it makes the technology look bad. So I think there has to be this rational, like blockchain doesn't apply everywhere where SQL can be applied in most places that many people are pushing blockchain. If there's an irrational push for DAOs and NFTs and blockchains in places where they don't belong, then people are going to reject them in places where they could actually work. So I think that's where it's like the, the more people exaggerate the use cases, the less likely people are going to realistically implement them. Yeah, there's some interesting points in particular, um, again, from my previous experiences with um, kind of doing union stuff and like trying to get people to do additional stuff on top of uh, the work that they're already doing. Like, I certainly feel that pain. Like, I know how difficult of an ask that is and that it takes a, a lot of human work, a lot of human connection. Um, and in some ways, the some of the promises that we sometimes see from kind of governance structures or processes is that that'll take care of that human thing and i'm not entirely convinced yet that uh, you can replace that human thing with uh, automated structures or bots um but i also you know i think that's very insightful on maybe the exaggeration of use cases making it less likely to um be something that people would want to adopt but i also want to make sure that we get to umar so go for it umar uh i i definitely just want to say like uh fully agreeing with what chris said at the end there about how like there's so much hype around blockchain that it almost like gets ahead of itself and it ends up being counterproductive because it's like it's 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 such an over promise that it's like it cannot possibly deliver all of the you know world changing things that sometimes people in web3 speak to and especially because like coming back to some of the cooperative and union stuff that was brought up DAOs are just recreating a lot of these existing structures. And I, I think personally uh, guilty um, 
of of being a proponent of oh we're doing something new here not really knowing that we're doing something that's uh, been done before um, especially in the union space and I want to share this uh, video of a talk uh, slash fireside chat with Sarah Horowitz um, at uh, Funding the Commons where they talk about mutualism and they really get into a lot of great depth about unions and how a lot of the things DAOs are doing are just doing unions over again. One really spicy take from Sarah is DAOs are just unions with discords and I'm like yes that's, that really is what we are. Um, and um, and yet uh, DAOs also you know I'll mention that Right now, I'm uh, when I'm not at Scurf, I'm over at Gitcoin DAO, and we've experienced a lot of pains recently with uh, scaling as a DAO, in uh, growing too fast, growing too big, and not always growing with the right people. And now it, 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 we come to a time where we need to actually scale down and shrink, and it's really hard to do that in a decentralized way. It's really hard to like um, uh, um, just like decide who's in the the wrong roles and maybe needs to be put into the right roles um when there's no hierarchy there's like no like go to okay this is the person making the decision and you know in these uh, decentralized groups no one wants to be the bad guy and no one wants to be uh the, the sort of bearer of bad news and um so you know there are also like plenty of like good things about hierarchy that we're not really getting in DAOs. Um, and it'll be interesting to see, I think, as, as DAOs kind of shape up and grow, um, how do they handle uh, areas of tension? How do they handle areas of disagreement? And can they come up with systems that, that handle that well and robustly and manage to maintain what's great about DAOs, which is a social connection, um, and, and balance that with the need for like accountability and decision-making? Thank you very much. Uh, photos, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can, yep. All right, all right. Okay, uh, I don't know where to start because uh, the conversation has been going to all different, all these different directions, but there's a common thread, which is, which uh, I think Chris brought up, uh, the fact that in DAOs, there's this assumption that's always there, like it's at least in all DAOs have been, um, that workers will self-manage uh, and they will do this effectively, and all work will be done. And this is also, and this is an assumption mainly from the people who are mostly in uh, upper, more core contributors, DAO leaders in operations. They assume for some reason that other people will also uh, do that and will also uh, approach things that way, which is not the case. And people are uh, constantly hitting against this wall over and over and over again. Um, but what I want to um, say here, I would disagree that what people actually want when they're in their nine to five, in their traditional uh, TradFi, Web2 or web, not Web2 uh, corporation uh, or uh, workplace is not actually the hierarchy, neither nine to, nine to five. There's something more fundamental that they need. It's the safety net uh, that this, um, that both their position and the benefits of being in the position in, in a legal sense give them. Like, as you said, Paul, there's no, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, like the artwork is in a gray zone. Yeah, nobody's going to pay for your dental appointment. Nobody's going to, uh um take care of insurance but um these are not something that cannot be done and uh these are not necessary to be done in a hierarchical uh, manner the safety net the security that actually that this is what actually at least from my point of view people need and also the ability to not have to think of everything and deal with all these different issues and being in this chaotic mode of a man manager, I would say, they don't want to deal with that. So I think this is, a, this is the most fundamental thing. And I, I don't know if this also can be done in a decentralized way, because from my <laughs> experience also, there's the opposite happening with like the tyranny of structurelessness, 
like this uh, work gets too much it's not managed correctly and people have too much responsibilities and so it's both inefficient and actually uh involuntarily oppressive without somebody being the oppressor um so i think there's a middle ground uh, we don't have to go either oh yeah the, either the decentralized way or the central completely centralized hierarchical uh, non-democratic uh corporate way there's a middle ground and i think DAOs are moving uh a bit away from just pure decentralization at least those that were um and actually accepting that's more like polycentric types of governance uh where there's various uh, uh, um hubs of accountability are more okay and that leadership is also important and that nobody w has to self-manage without learning how to do so so um uh, but the the direction and the tendency to actually be aware of these things is way more i can see it now it's uh it's going this is the evolution of DAOs that we're if there's like a third wave of DAOs, <laughs> this is it. Like uh, uh, unions with a uh, Mulgasig and <laughs> in the inter on the internet. Well, thank you for that. And then, John, I'm going to get to you. Then maybe we can start to pivot towards what are the steps that we, as a organization here at Scurf, can be doing to maybe start working towards solutions here. But yeah, John, go ahead. Yeah, I think I'll actually be able to pivot to that very nicely. Um, First of all, I agree with Fotos completely. I think anarchy or polycentrism is the direction this is all going. A hundred years from now, it'll be that type of system. And it, it ties into um, what Umar brought up with the, the talk he posted. Yes, currently DAOs are just um, co-ops or unions with discords, um, but the they are that uh, with this technology that's radically different, that enables some really cool new stuff to happen. Like it's not just because they don't function now or they don't provide these benefits now uh, doesn't mean they won't down the road um, once people do continue experimenting. I think Rich brought up um, one of the, the organizations that's doing worker protections, work on worker protections. So there's there's a lot of experimentation and it's just don't expect it to happen yet. Don't expect it to happen in your lifetime even. Like this is going to take a very long time to work out how these things are going to actually function. And it's uh, with regards to the middle ground comment, I think it is sort of like a middle ground, but I would see it more like a fluid ground where when you have these polycentric systems, they can shift in which node or which hub is actually in greater control at a given point in time based on the context of the environment around them. So if you need a very hierarchical structure to get through like a war or something like that, where you need to be making snap decisions, you can call on Caesar. But if you're just in good times and you don't need like you don't want to give that one person all that power so they can abuse it. You can live through the Senate. You can live through all this, this representation uh, and you can be even more fluid than that too. So it's with, with SCURF and this also ties back into what Umar was saying about the scaling issue. Um, I, I think it's about going very slowly uh, and not getting into an issue where you hype up, and this goes to what Chris was saying too, you hype up the blockchain, you hype up the technology, and you just dive in as far as you can go as quickly as you can. And then, you know, a year later, uh, you realize that, uh oh, we got to, we don't have the mechanisms to scale back. We don't really know how to deal with times that are a little more difficult. Uh, so it, it's just, it, seems safer and more conservative to go slowly experiment with some cool technology as it comes out but don't make it part of the infrastructure that uh, an organization depends on because it's probably going to change in six months anyway um but at the same time heck maybe something really cool comes out tomorrow and it should be what scares <laughs> about that Yeah, absolutely. Find the thing that works uh, and adopt it quickly and then experiment with the stuff that uh, maybe doesn't work yet. Um, yeah, to Chris's point, it would be nice to have that kind of rationality. So kind of pivoting into the uh, how do we kind of solve these things um, is, you know, where can we pull from things um, or what maybe are some criteria that should be applied to institutions or ideas from the past? So um, unions are 
pretty old co-ops the idea of co-ops quite old um there are some good things from those types of organizations that maybe we could just be implementing immediately but are there some type of criteria that we should be applying um you know for example like it has always been my view that like one of the downsides of unions for example is that they are they're always reactionary right so part of the nature of unions, or at least the unions that I've had direct interaction with, is they are inherently a reactive as opposed to a proactive organization. They, they come into being uh, because of often, like a condition gets to a certain point where people decide to do collective action and, like, because they've been um, taken advantage of, right? So they are inherently this kind of reactionary force. Uh, so we would want to avoid that while kind of taking advantage of some of the union things, um, of some of their benefits as well. So uh, yeah, Chris, go ahead. So I know this is like going back a very long way, um, but the division of labor and society by Emil Durkheim is something that I read in college and it's, it still applies in modernity. So I think there's things where if people understand the frameworks that were created in like the 19th century that still apply today, then it, it, it's easier to see what works over time and what scales because then we have uh data to either confirm or deny things that were like posed in Durkheim's frameworks so i think that's where like you you can go back and look at like karl marx and say a lot of the stuff he said was wrong because x y and z but there's thing places where he's right about his economic frameworks in places where he was wrong. You can go back and look at Durkheim and say he's right about division of labor in these places, or you can go back and Adam Smith, he's very correct in certain places. So there's like all these things about, like I'm not saying Scurf should read Emil Durkheim, it's more so because I went on a path for my uh, degree where I had to like learn economic and social history, sociology history, and like all these like social structures. I was exposed to these things that give me insight into like, oh, the way that Emil Durkheim explains management in his framework, it's like that's the reason management should exist. It's not there arbitrarily, it's like ultimately a worker who needs to manage their time doesn't need to spend time managing their their own work if if someone else can like tell them when to take a break and tell them when to go then all they need to focus on is when they take a break and when they go they don't actually have to measure the time so that's where like something yeah it's like i'm not saying we should but it's it's an amazing connection of frameworks that were created in like 19th century that still apply in the 21st century so i think in that context it's not to say like yes we need to look at like where we don't need to reinvent the wheel and where spokes that were created 200 years ago still work today um and i think that's like that connection to past frameworks with the capacity to then verify or uh confirm that these frameworks did not work allows us to then say okay we can try this new thing with the understanding that these people tried this and framed this and then it worked in these contexts and it, this is why it didn't work in these contexts. But that's it's a huge lift, but that's also why we can just consult historians. Yeah, in some ways I see this as being one of the things that SCURF as an organization can be potentially helping this space with. Um, I mean, we're specifically kind of talking about like, HR working with like arrangements uh, between workers management, all that type of stuff. Um, but, you know, I, from observationally, and I think it's kind of come up in this call a few times as well, uh, there is a tendency in our space to reinvent, uh, to get very excited about um, a new project or a new way of doing things uh, without necessarily having access right because it can be an access thing uh to pass frameworks and things like that and uh while i, I do not necessarily think that this is a uh, maybe the best venue to start talking about like a content type uh, for the forum or something like that um i do wonder if there are ways that through our forum through kind of the information bridging that we are trying to do here mission wise as 
an organization if there might not be a way for us to surface and make more readily available, more kind of fleshed out and complete frameworks. So like here's a way to do management. Here's another way to do management, uh, somewhat to what Chris was saying. And I'm kind of wondering it, um, what people would think about an approach like that, uh, especially keeping in mind um, Fotis's observation that I also agree with that um, we do kind of ignore history when it comes to Web3. John, go for it. Yeah, I like the, uh, I think we talked about this just the other day, the idea of like creating a sandbox uh, where, with SCURF where you can present different options to people coming into the space. Like here are a couple of different management tools. Uh, you can participate in SCURF without using them at all. You don't need to go into Web3. You don't need to sync a wallet uh, or learn any of these new terms. But if it's something you want to do, by all means, we'll do it with you. We're going to have some fun. We'll all learn about it together and we'll see what, how this can help, like if you're a researcher, how this can help you with your research or managing a team uh, or with your institution either, even down the line. I think that's a, a great um, value proposition that SCURF can offer. Yeah, and kind of on top of that, um, the reading list, because I definitely know that that is a thing that we're interested in. Um, one of the things that I like about John's idea here of kind of like this sandbox is like, well, what would that look like? So. What would an HR sandbox look like? Like, what type of, type of things do we have to make sure that we cover? Um, what types of things um, would be included in that sandbox or that toolkit, right? So, um, yeah, Chris, go for it. So, actually, I've helped countries design regulatory sandboxes. Um, and one of the things that are essential with sandboxes are hard edges. Um, you want legal protections and then you want frameworks within those legal protections in which people can specifically operate under a class or uh, some sort of identification. Um, and that's like the Mauritian government is one of the leading cryptocurrency sandboxes like concerning like and I, I was very much tied in with helping them like start that sandbox which is where um it, it they're best at small scale to start obviously in the sense of it it sounds like logical to start at, at small scale but you would be amazed at how many people try to start off like at a hundred thousand users up um but ultimately like creating sandbox environments that are also alongside uh working markets is a, a much better environment in which sandboxes like you shouldn't i'm not saying you shouldn't but it's not the best approach to go into a place that is not high functioning and then try to do a sandbox there because there's too many external like extraneous variables to actually come down on like whether your product is what's working or whether it's just something else in the environment or if it's your product is not working or if it's something else in the environment um, and that's, it comes down to the real world is not a laboratory, so you can only find correlation and not causation. Um, but the more the sandbox can be like have those hard edges, then the easier it is to, to say like, oh, these are the correlations that we discovered within this sandbox. I actually like this idea, and, and to my mind, this is potentially a emergent project um, that SCURF could potentially be working on. So I see that we have kind of a reading list start that Umar's got going on there. Um, when it comes to what this could look like at SCURF as a potential project, and just recognize that we could kind of be brainstorming uh, out loud here, um, what might be those next steps of working towards making those sandboxes how would we get the players or what players would we need to have involved here um what are the types of steps uh what are the types of questions that have to get answered uh, things like that um i'm not so sneakily proposing uh, that we start working on a project proposal here as a group uh, and so i'm gonna hopefully be taking down some additional notes as people kind of think about what would they want um this type of project to maybe cover or where are starting spots besides a reading group Hey, can I ask some clarifying questions? Yeah, absolutely. So 
let me just summarize all of this here. So you're proposing some sort of HR sandbox. Is that correct? Some sort of like, we're going to bring a bunch of people together and answer what questions exactly? Or are we defining the questions? So to me, I think some of the first steps would be about defining the questions that a sandbox, like that people would need answers from, or giving people an opportunity to collaborate. Um, as I believe uh, Rich had mentioned earlier and has been part of these conversations uh, in general, right? there are uh, several organizations that are, I think now as the, the space is starting to mature, like these are the types where we're having to find questions or we're trying to identify what are the key questions uh, and things that people want from their DAO, from their experiences. Fotis kind of mentioned these types of things as well. Uh, so I'm not necessarily proposing uh, yet that we create a sandbox uh, for people to kind of do these things in, uh, but basically like how would we even get there? What are the things that we might need in place? Like, is this something that is kind of scurf aligned of kind of helping people do uh, the HR of Web3. So like I said, this is still a very emergent idea, um, but I could see this being a, you know, it's kind of spin off of some of the work that is happening uh, with governance, um, but I also see it as being um, a clear collaboration point between some of the mechanism design things, right? So how can we put mechanisms in place that incentivize people to take agency when there's an opportunity or when they are aligned with agency or where are there opportunities for people um, to just kind of do their nine to five and uh, maybe signal that they agree with things. So again, kind of just big general um, brainstorming. So, but as far as like, but as far as like, I know we only have a few more minutes, but as far as like, like HR goes, like fulfilling people's needs like fulfilling very human needs like i'm not, how, like how does that have to do with agency like so i mean hr as a general thing can can do a lot of things um, i know that there are some people who are kind of suspicious of like hr as a kind of hierarchical thing and like who they serve but like Human relations can also do a whole bunch of stuff in addition to just kind of taking people in, hiring, and making sure that kind of policies are satisfied. Um, I think that there are some HR functions that could help people do things like, like again, I'm just going to start from listing some questions off as opposed to having real answers for these. But like, what does professional development look like, right? So HR is often a space where people, um, get resources to do professional development well, what does that look like in web3 like how do you direct someone's kind of career path or give them the resources to self-direct those career paths right so there's some kind of agency components there um, how do we do things like potentially mediate types of conflicts or um, as umar had kind of talked about how do you kind of re like take your assets and kind of uh, move them around, uh, kind of do some realigning and things along those lines. Like, how do you give people the tools that empower them to do so, that, or see people how the, how they're connected to that process? Yeah. So I, I I'll say one more thing because uh, uh, what I what I really hear through this whole conversation, and maybe this is right, maybe this is wrong, is the question really being how do we actually focus on people here, mm -hmm. and what do we value? so that we can determine how we actually focus on people here. And I think that SCURF does lack answering both of those things. And so, but I think I think reorienting to how do we actually have a focus on people here is pretty significant. Absolutely, so could you elaborate on that focusing on people? So I think when you're, I think when you're people oriented, you're, your organization can look much different like what we do looks much different how we connect with with each other looks much different um your experience oriented rather than uh, output or outcome oriented um i think among, among other things but i does that make sense like i think like when you orient yourself around yeah how do we how do we do the most that we can for people you're just going to get a lot of different answers. Does that make, yeah, that, 
that's all I, I don't think that's a binary decision that needs to be made though so it's not like you either do people or you do work right you can surf is a enormously mission focused organization at least as far as i'm concerned the mission comes first but it doesn't mean we can't uh make efforts uh to um ensure that we are treating our people as best as we possibly can so i, I don't think that it, there, there's obviously a spectrum here, so we can figure out where on this thing we all decide that we want to be and whether that is supportable and whether it still allows us to complete the mission and all the rest of it but uh it's still you know, like i said it's not a one or the other okay. um, thank you for that reminder we do not always have to make binary decisions I don't think it's a binary decision to orient towards people within the mission. I don't think that's binary. I'm not sure how it well, is. So what, do you mean? so what do you mean about that's a, this is a radical change and that it, if we're people focused, it's not the same as being more focused. Like, yeah, I, I, yeah, I wouldn't take that as, I wouldn't take that as binary. There's not like a decision there. It's just, what are we prioritizing? Um, and I think when we're, if we're prioritizing people and how people come in and connect and and do all of that then it, like i would i just don't think that's binary i think it's just how we're prioritizing how we're prioritizing what we do towards yeah towards well, i don't know maybe I'm, I'm misunderstanding what you mean by prioritizing so um i don't think any organization will succeed in prioritizing people over the organization um it's just uh it's not a reasonable expectation. Organizations exist because they have to do something. Um, they can support their people as best as they possibly can, and then they can do uh, new initiatives and experiment with different ways of working in order to support that mission. But I don't think that we're prioritizing people over work or work over people. That's where the binary decision, like what is the priority? If it's people, that's one thing. If it's work, that's another thing. So there's that's where I see that there's a binary decision to be made there. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I think okay. inherently, if you treat individuals as like unique, you can't make it like a binary thing. And this is where the management's job is to seemingly determine the individual's needs to prevent them from burning out in their responsibilities, which is going to vary from individual to individual. And that's where I think it is like, it takes a lot of effort to treat individuals within an organization as unique and to find what is like motivating, but also find their limits so that they don't push themselves to their limit and the management can prevent them from burning themselves out. Um, but that's also where it, it is like a huge lift to do that for individuals versus like proto or archetypes. And I think that's where it's easier to manage towards archetypes because of time restraints rather than to full individual personal level, which is I think it's an admirable goal, but time makes it so that we end up having to go towards archetypes. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why you see a whole bunch of desire for generational like if you have a z manage them this way if you have an x manage them this way um and we know that you know those generational differences kind of really don't make that much difference empirically um but yeah so we're looking for kind of these archetypes that shows up in pr it shows up in hr literature so uh, how can you scale treating individuals like individuals and maybe that's kind of getting to what Valerie's getting to as well like so making that people focus like feeling like you are being treated uh, like a like a individual within your organization as opposed to a class of individual within that organization uh, which is a significant scaling problem um i am still very interested in seeing like where this could potentially go outside of this community call um, I do not have a concrete project uh, in mind, uh, but anyone who's kind of interested in tackling these types of issues and like, hey, how can SCRF be doing these types of things? Um, you know, that's obviously maybe a, a little bit more at the forefront of my mind, uh, but also just how can we be providing some uh, value to the space and kind of doing our mission alignment of helping Web3 become better? Um, I'd be really interested in ideas here. And 
Brian, I'll give you the last 10 seconds of our community call today. <laughs> Great, thanks. I will be fast. Scurf.io, a new website. We just put it up this week. And tomorrow is the uh, Discord chat community guild meeting. And I would uh, love if anybody has anything to say about our Discord community server um, to join that. You can find the link in, in chat up in the top corner under events. And that's tomorrow at, I think, what is it, 1 o'clock? Or is it noon? Sorry, let me just look really quick. While you're looking, I just want to follow on that. The, the chat is a, one of our primary tools to collaborate and do all the work and discuss the meta about our work as well. Uh, it's critically important that we have the tool that works for us. And so if anybody has any strong opinions or ideas about how to improve or alter uh, our existing chat, please join us. It's super important. It's tomorrow at 1 PM. Uh, Pacific time. Awesome. Well, thank you for that plug for all the community work and input that we can be having. Uh, I thought that today was a pretty good discussion, and I'm looking forward to continuing it in chat and uh, in various projects. And with that, I hope everyone has a delightful day. <laughs>